All right. We are studying, going to continue tonight. Um, it's great to see everybody here uh, that you survived the monsoon rain, right? It was pretty bad there for a little bit. I thought it was going to wash us all away, but uh, we made it, and um, we are here tonight. It's uh, time to continue our faith series. How many of you have ever said to yourselves, how in the world do I build my faith? You know, the Lord said that every man had a measure of faith, right? Um, and, you know, there's several different levels of faith. There's no faith. There's a measure of faith. There's little faith. There's great faith. There's, and it goes on and on. But I wanted to know, how do I get from no or little faith to great faith, to extraordinary faith? You know, to where I can believe God for anything. That's where I want to be. And so I've, I asked God over the years, how do I build my faith? And he's told me over the years, I've, I've learned a lot of ways that I can build that faith. And um, this is going to be a little interactive tonight. If you need an ink pen, then you could let one of uh, Brother Freeze or Brother Warren know or Danny it, just raise your hand if you might need a, an ink pen or something because there's going to be fill in the blanks here so you can follow along. Um, I learned long ago teaching that it helps in a class like this if you have a fill in the blank because that it kind of forces people to pay attention. It forces people to get engaged. It helped me because my little brain sometimes will squirrel. Anybody got squirrels in their attic? Yeah. That's me. So um, it helps me to kind of follow along with someone when I have fill in the blanks. So, um, you know, this is going to really sound controversial. And I don't want you to think that I don't believe in prayer because I absolutely believe in prayer. Prayer is something we've got to have. It's crucial. We've got to have prayer in our lives. But in order to build your faith, do you realize that it's not as much grown by prayer as it is by hearing God's word and doing God's word. You know, prayer is a part of doing God's word, right? And it, so it's, but really building your faith before we can even, this is number one, before we can even activate our faith, we have to know who God is. How are you going to have faith in someone or something that you don't know who it is? You don't know much about that, that person, or you don't know much about God. So we have to know that we have, in order to activate our faith, that's number one, we have to know who God is. Look at A, God is, he is anything you need, right? He's your provider, he's your healer, he's your lawyer, he's your doctor, um, he's everything. He's Exactly. I am means I am whatever you need. You, yeah, exactly. So if you look at Hebrews 11 and 6, it says there, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. So for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, he is whatever you need, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But we also know, if you look at B, God is the word, right? The word is God. God is the word. Um, look at John 1 and 1. And I hope you'll interact with me here tonight. If you've got something you want to inject, please inject it. But John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John 1 and 2, the same was in the beginning with God. And John 1 and 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So God is anything you need. He is the Word. And see, he is for us. So many people try to put God in the same box that they put their father in, their earthly father. How many of you had, you don't have to show your hands, but how many of you had a rough relationship with your dad on earth? And sometimes you, act, you think that God 
sees you like your dad sees you. It, 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 uh, it's one of those things that we do subconsciously. It's not something that we do that we think about. Sometimes we think that if we had a judgmental dad, we think that God is judgmental toward us. If we had a dad that was abusive, then we see God as sitting up in heaven waiting to strike us with the next lightning bolt when we mess up or we do something wrong or we don't get it right. So that's not the God we serve. We have to understand that our God is love and he is for us even when we make an epic mistake. He is for us even when we just can't seem to get it right. He is for us even when we don't talk to him like we should. Now, it's always better if we talk to him, but he's not against us. He's on our side. That's your next one. He is on our side. And once we wrap our minds around who he is and that he is for us and that he is, was for the people that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11, that great faith chapter all through the New Testament, then we have to accept that we're his children and his promises are for us. You know, you got something? Yes, I just wanted to say that uh, we try to stereotype the Lord with the way humanity acts. Try to humanize him, yeah. And we try to humanize him. Listen, God loves us unconditionally. Absolutely. We are his children. Mm -hmm. uh, we laugh about it. Sometimes we talk about he does not tear up your birth certificate. Right. God's not going to divorce you. Right. Uh, all he asks is just be there. Talk to me. And that's the beauty of this God we serve is I don't have to worry about, well, if I go talk to him today, is he going to be mad at me today or, right. or, or what? What do I expect? He, he, uh, my Bible says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and right? Amen. And when you get on your knees and you talk to him about, you know, every, he knows that, Brother Dexter mentioned it Sunday. He already knows before you get on your knees what you've been doing or what's been going on in your mind. It's not a shock to him. And so I just long time ago, I relinquish all of that to him, and I say, Lord, here's what I tell the Lord. Lord, I, I know you're a gentleman, but I give you full permission to probe my mind, my heart, my life, however you want to. I don't want anything to be hidden. Right. I want you to know everything about me inside and out. And I want you to direct my paths and, and give me wisdom from above. And whatever that may be, whether I like it or not, I'm going to follow it. Right. And, you know, he's always been good to me. He And my wife, he supplies all of our needs according to his riches and glory. You know, there's been a few times we've gotten tight, but we've never had to go hungry. We've never wondered where the bill money was going to come right. from and or how we were going to get a car fixed. It always just worked. And we've learned to just trust him. And when things pop up, we just say, well, the Lord's going to help us take care of it. And he does. Even if it means giving us the knowledge to go down in the backyard and work on it and fix it. Yeah, that's right. But I love him yeah. so much and he's so good. I can get out any morning, Brother Dexter, and talk to him and he's right there. Absolutely. He ain't in no mood or anything like that. And it doesn't matter what I did yesterday. Even if I hadn't talked to him about it, he ain't in no mood. He's right there. He loves me. I, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Amen. You know, that's the God we serve. He's a God of love. Amen. And and love doesn't change. Absolutely. Get that in your mind. Love doesn't change. It's something that's permanent. Amen. Amen. That's good. See, as God is for us, he is on our side. He is on our side. Yep. And um, D, we have to accept that we're his children and his promises are for us. But how do we take ownership? Ownership is D of those promises. Remember, we have to believe that he is and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That rewarder means one who pays wages. Isn't that cool? And of those who diligently, diligent means in, to investigate, to search out, or to crave. So if we're craving him, we can take ownership of his promises. When we do what we're 
supposed to do and let God do what he does best, which is love us and, and provide for us and set a path for us. But let's go a little bit deeper. If God is the word, now listen to this. This is what I really want you to get tonight. Because this is something that if you can really grab hold of it, you, your faith can really grow. If God is the word, then when we speak his word out loud, we are speaking God himself out loud into our space and into our situation. Do you get that? That if... If God is the word, then when we speak his word out loud, we are speaking God himself into our space and into our situation, into our circumstance, into the, what's going on with me right now. When I speak God's word out loud, it's the living word. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a second. You remember Seth talking a few weeks ago about Blue, old Miss Blue that had all the kids and how that... Um, if somebody can go help her get those kids to thank you. Um, and how that when she spoke to those kids, they were at home, and those here was all these kids, their dad was gone, and all of a sudden she says, There's nothing in the house to eat, and she tells those kids, I'm going to pray. You know you don't bother me when I pray. I'm going to pray, and when I come out of that room, there's gonna be groceries in this house. She was speaking a Rima word. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. He said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. So she was speaking that out to those kids and saying, I'm going to pray when I get out, God's going to put groceries in this house. And he did. He did. There was a man came and had, they had groceries on the counter. They had them on the floor. They were everywhere because she spoke God's word out. And said, this is going to happen because God said it would. And this is his word. So just tuck that away for just a minute. Now, there are two types of descriptive operation of God's word. That one is Rema, R-H-E-M-A. And two, the, the second one is Logos. Rema is, if you can look at number th Roman numeral three, Rima is an utterance or a thing said. It's something that is said, spoken out. Logos is the written word of God, discourse, a plea, or reasoning with us. So Logos, and that's the two different things. That it, they're both words, but one is a spoken word and one is a written word. It's a written account. So God is omnipresent. Yes, he's everywhere, but... When God speaks to us directly, it's called a Rima word. When he spoke to Abraham and told him, I'm going to make you a father of many nations, that was a Rima word. That was a promise that God gave Abraham. So it was a spoken promise. But then you have the written promise where we read about Abraham. So the first time that, a, that Rima was used in the New Testament was when Jesus was being tempted by Satan for 40 days and he was tempting him to, why don't you just make this stone into bread and eat it? Jesus didn't tell him, I rebuke you. He didn't tell him, I can't stand you. He didn't tell him, get away from me. All he looked at him and said, it is written. He used logos. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, which is Rima, that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And that's Matthew 4 and 4. Rima is used 70 times in the New Testament Greek. And, I'm, you know, I'm still talking about faith here. Just hold on. But it's used 70 times in the New Testament. Logos is the written word, but when it's activated, when we activate God's promises and we speak it out loud again, that's when the Rima word comes alive for us. That's when we, we make it come alive. It's like claiming territory for yourself. It really is. It's like stepping here and saying, hey, this is mine right here. I'm claiming this. And that's the way we have to be with God. He wants us to be that way with him. He wants us to claim his word and speak his word again. You know, it, I can imagine the Lord is saying, 
man, they, they believe me. They, they're speaking my word over their situation. So they're having faith for that. That's faith. So by faith, we speak a rhema word from the living logos over our lives, our families, our homes, our jobs, our health, our neighbors, whatever your situation, whatever the need is, we speak that rhema word over that. Then we begin to, what happens is we've adopted that promise and we literally speak life into deadness. We literally speak healing into sickness and we speak provision into nothingness like Blue did. When I come out of that prayer room, there's going to be groceries in this house. It can happen. So when we operate by faith, God will give us the answers before the questions even come up. He's done that for me. He's given me a provision before before I even needed it. You know, how many times have, has that happened to us, honey? We would get a check in the mail, and we would say, wait a minute. Yeah. Don't blow it. Don't blow it <laughs> because something's going to come up that God was giving you provision beforehand. That happened with us with a tire once. Yeah, in 1993, Celia and I had already packed majority of our stuff up and it was in the hallway of the trailer we lived in and we were pretty convinced we were coming to Manning but we didn't have a clue how we were going to get here financially okay we still owed some some money there um it just it was an impossibility based off of our ability and the strangest things happen sometimes but my brother had a little girl and she passed away during birth and he was in the navy and uh she got and stayed in the birth canal too long and we lost her the saddest thing it was the first death in our immediate family we'd ever dealt with didn't know what to do and she passed away her name was samantha she was she would be just a little bit older than haley now but my brother got a settlement from the military from losing the baby and he tithed to my wife and I off the settlement and that was just enough I'm talking down to within 50 cents of getting us out of debt I'm um, debtless and, and to a point to where we could move uh, so we weren't able to move right that minute so going into 94 we really were excited had our stuff packed up waiting on God, and, you know, it finally it rolled into 1995. No door still hadn't opened, and I finally looked at her, and I said, Darling, we're moving. By faith. We're, we're going to move by faith. I said, we've been sitting here all this time for God to open up this door, and let's just walk right through it. And I, up until that point, y'all, I had never really, uh, what can I say, exercised my faith to that degree or that level. So I called up a brother. I'm going to try to hurry. I don't want to take up too much time. So I called a brother up in the church that owned a house in Sumter. And he had it down there. It was empty. And he had it up for sale. And I asked him, I said, look, would you let us live in your home? Let us rent it while you're trying to sell it. Well, he said, no. He said, y'all track the floors up and this and this and that. And, you know, we really want to keep the place clean. Well, the Lord worked again. He called me about two weeks later. He says, man, you ain't going to believe this. Somebody broke in the house and stole all the televisions. He said, you can come live there rent free if you'll just pay to turn the water on and, and keep the place, the grass mowed and what have you. So that was a door opened right there. That's faith. That's so we, now, now we move into this place now. He says, we can only inhabit this one room. It's a bedroom with no windows in it. We're from the mountains up there where it's nice and cool and crisp in the evenings. And we showed up down here and it's hot. And we had no air condition. All we had was an attic fan. And we didn't realize it, but we were not in the best part of Sumter. <laughs> but so we slept with the back door open so the air could churn a little bit. But all of that just fell right into place once we made up our mind. And we threw a, we'd been trying to sell our home and sell our home and sell it 
and we just couldn't get a buyer. And finally, in the middle of all of that, a dear brother in the church says, I want to buy your house. He said, I'm, I'm selling my house in Ohio, and I want to buy what y'all have there. So around May 1st, somewhere along in there, he bought the house. We're living down here now by faith. Okay, took every dime we had just to get there. I got me a, I got a job, second application. The guy hired me. So it just went click, click, and I had a job. And it, we lived within just a, probably a mile or two from where I worked. So it worked out real good. I had me a 68 model bug I fixed up just to get good gas mileage to get me back and forth to work because I want to do the Lord's work, you know. And uh, it all worked out. The house we're in now came up for sale just automatically. The house sold. Everything clicked and fell right into place. And it was because we took that initial step, and that's what got things rolling. And sometimes right. God's just waiting on you to step out there. You know, they say the only thing standing between you and success is hesitation. Absolutely. Amen. We'd still be sitting there in Anderson waiting on God to open the door. And Amen. Amen. Absolutely. I know that was lengthy, but I'm going to tell you, that was a, a trip. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. We were doing a lot of speaking of our faith then. We were claiming a lot of things, claiming a lot of promises. We rode by our house and claimed that house in the name of the Lord and spoke scriptures over it. We came here and claimed this building, you know, because this, this used to be the sanctuary. And um, no other, nothing else, just this and a bathroom. Um, so... We spoke God's word, and look at number five on your sheet. In the beginning, God spoke, and things were created. God's spoken word creates things. Amen. Does, it makes things happen. Does anybody need an ink pen or anything? There we go. Good, good, good. So, yeah, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth by doing what? He spoke. He spoke and mountain chains were created, seas covered the earth. He spoke and all the animals were created. But mankind was the only thing that was not created by spoken word. He created us from the dust of the ground, you guys, Adam. And he created Eve by rib from Adam. So no wonder we give the Lord such fit. Because everything else in creation obeys at his command. At what he, I mean, the, the seas obey him. The stars and the moon and the sun and the wind obeys him. It all obeys him. And he gets to mankind, and it comes to a screeching halt because we're hard-headed, don't, aren't we? We, we just we want to do, do things our way, but we've got our own free will to wrestle with. But getting back to that spoken word, if his spoken word creates then won't creation take place again when we use that same word of God like he did? Didn't he say that we would do greater things than him? When he walked the earth, he said we would do greater things than him. He did. So if we speak his word like he spoke his word, we can create again. We create opportunity for God to move again, right? We create a space for God to come. It's like a portal. It's an opportunity for God to come, and he comes down. It's not like in a bottle. It's a God-given tool that God gave us to operate and live in the world. He has not left us powerless. That's your next word. He has not left us powerless. So, let's look at A. So, by faith, he speaks his words, and he once again creates. We speak, and we activate divine intervention in our lives. This is how we can build our faith. This is how we can build our faith. Look at Deuteronomy 30 and 19. Somebody want to read that for us? Deuteronomy 30 and 19 is right there on your sheet. Go ahead, Dexter. I call heaven and earth to witness this day against you that I have set before you life and death, the blessings and the cursings. Therefore, choose life that you and your descendants may live. Amen. He said it again. Proverbs 18, 21. Who wants to read that one? Go ahead and read it in the mic. Proverbs 18 and 21. 
under the paper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 18 and 21 that life and death or are, are death and life are in the power of the tongue and they who indulge in it shall eat the fruit of it for death or life. I choose life. Amen. Let me just add this real quick. Talking about my brother's baby passing away. We get moved here and his wife's pregnant again. Okay. Yes, this is another So this is the story. second baby now, Brother Fugate, that's coming. Okay. Her name's Candace. They delivered her cesarean. Of course, that didn't mash the water out of her lungs. Instantly, her body did what they call shunting. Mm -hmm. And it started going back to the umbilical cord to try to get oxygen. Well, there was no cord there. So she got pneumonia and she was she was dying because it was trying to go back to the court. Crazy stuff's happening. They ship her down to MUSC down there. She's done been down there a week. Me and my wife, we managed to get off work. We're just young preachers, okay? Still hadn't got here yet, okay? This was in 93, I'm pretty sure, wasn't it? And I'm just as dumb as a bag of hammers on how the spirit works. I just, all I knew was have faith, you know, and believe in God, speak the word. And we got up that morning. The baby was in there. On, he had a jet run down her throat, keeping her alive. And they had already punctured one of her they done, they done, The doctor had already said her, the oxygen level in her blood had done went way below anything survivable, not being a vegetable and that type thing. So we went to McDonald's that morning, and I'm telling you, as sure as I sit here, the Lord spoke to me because I asked him, I said, what do we do, Lord? You know, I'm just a new guy at this. You know, what what do I do? I, you know, I'm asking you to help me here. He said, he gave me specific instructions. He said, take a McDonald's napkin. He said, anoint that napkin with oil. And in the grieving room, y'all pray over the napkin. I said, okay. He said, then go into her room and place it under her mattress. And I'll heal her. Yeah, so I get everybody in, the, in this in this grieving room, okay, and the Holy Ghost comes into that room in a way I've never experienced since. There was one lady in there was singing in tongues, and she had never spoken a language like that. Okay, it just come on her, and she went to singing, Brother Mike, in in another language. Well, while all this is going on. They knock on the door and said, we're fixing to take the bag off of her. They're bagging her right now, and we're going to let her pass, and that's going to be the end of it. They took the bag off. Guess what? She kept right on breathing. She started breathing on her own. But we had done put that napkin under her mattress. Mm -hmm. One month later, she went home, a normal child. She's still alive today and as normal as you and I. So it's the first miracle I've ever seen. But I followed his instructions yes. and took a, you might want to call it a stupid McDonald's <laughs> napkin. And I poured a little bit of oil on that napkin. And I just believed God that he'd do it. Yeah. And he did it. Mm -mm. It was the faith, yes. Absolutely. It was the obedience. It was the doing of it. And he doesn't need us to do great and mighty things. It's the simple things. It's, it's the ordinary things. And, you know, they did say she would be, they said if she survives, she'll be blind, she'll be deaf. Yeah, she won't be able to control her motor. She will have no motor, motor, motor control. And she's graduated college. She yeah. plays the piano. She's, you know, so many things. Nothing wrong with her at all. So... That's what happens when you choose life. Instead of saying, instead of saying, you know, God, I don't want these people. I'm going to look like an idiot doing this in that hospital room. That doctor's going to throw me out because he's going to say I'm crazy. We didn't care. But the doctor came. His doctor's name, her doctor's name was Art, and he came to him after all of this happened. And he said something came in that room today that I didn't bring. 
He said, he said, I can take no credit for what just happened in this room today. So, exactly, exactly. Whew. It was, yes, it was, absolutely. So, by faith, this is B, we say with our mouths, what we say with our mouths will either bring life into our situation or it brings death to it. So, we can bring death to sickness, Amen. We can, we can speak death to sickness or we can continue to complain and woe is me until we just keep fueling that sickness that's trying to destroy us. By faith, you can speak yourself healed like you can speak yourself sick. We have known so many people in our lives that just would not accept wellness because the sickness was their identity. And if they lost the sickness, then they don't, they don't know who they are without sickness. So we can speak ourselves, life into ourselves. I love the C. Say what you mean and mean what you say. How many, how many of your mothers have ever told you that? Say what you mean and mean what you say. I've said that to my kids over and over. If you believe God, you will by faith speak his word over your life. Say what God said and mean what God says. You have to believe what you're saying. And sometimes you just have to repeat his word until you start to believe it. Sometimes, you know, our faith gets a little weak and we have to practice it, right? I want to practice good faith. I want to practice doing what God says. Look at D. We have to get a revelation of the power and the importance of our words. We have that power in our mouths. James talked about the tongue and how unruly it was and, and how it could, great, it could start a great fire. It can kindle terrible things. But with that tongue, God can also bring life to us. He can speak life through us. Look at Matthew 12, 36 through 37. Who wants to read that? Go ahead, Warren. He said, by your own words, you're going to be justified. And by your own words, you're going to be condemned. We're on page two at um, D1. Look at the word idle. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. He needed that mic on that one. <laughs> Let's say that again. <laughs> Let's say that for those in, at home. Amen. Absolutely. Uh, the the out of word portion, you know, yes. is not just your out of words, but, you know, if you sit by and, and let someone, you know, I know that's some healthy boundaries that I've had to set is, you know, I'm going to go. I've, I've actually had to break this verse out on some people that I know. Yeah. That I was like, you know, in the Bible it says we're going to be accountable for every idle word. Right. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. I had to break out my Bible on them. Yes, right? it does. Here it is. Now what you got. Absolutely. And that also includes idle words about your pastor, about yeah. your ministers, yeah. about folks at your church, not just people that aren't in the church, right? So Even about uh, yourself. Even about yourself. That's right. That's right. You know, God didn't make any junk. And when we tear ourselves down, come on now. Look at the word idle here. In this original meaning, it's translated inoperative or non-working. Okay? If it's an inoperative word, why, you know, we're going to be held accountable for that. If it's something that's not operating in God's kingdom it's not operating for God's glory then it's inoperative right amen so when we speak our own words they're inoperative like when we try to defend ourselves when somebody's coming against us right but all of a sudden we start speaking that living logos especially that rema word and it becomes operative in our lives then he says oh 
All right, they've just activated my own words. So now I have to move. I have no choice but to answer because they just spoke my word. They've test, They've put me to the test, right? They've spoken my living word, so I have no cho- choice but to respond. Look at two. His word cannot lie. It is eternal. Matthew 24 and 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. God's word is going to be still standing when this world is completely destroyed. His word will still be here because God's word cannot pass away. Look at Ezekiel 12 and 25. Who wants to read that for us? Go ahead. In the, read it in the mic, Crystal, if you don't mind. <clears throat> Ezekiel twelve twenty five. For I am the Lord. I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. It shall be no more prolonged. For in your days, O rebellious house, will I say the word, and will perform it, saith the Lord God. Whew. How much more proof do we need that speaking God's word out, it says, it, he, didn't, he didn't say it might come to pass or most of the time comes to pass. He said it shall come to pass. So when we say his word out over a problem we're going through, anybody got some problems they're going through tonight? Anybody got some mountains in front of them that feel like there's no way I've got the strength to climb this mountain? Yeah. I can see it on your faces. I we know. Need to, we need to sharpen our skills because what's going on in your Ukraine yeah. can come here. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm telling you, we're going home to our warm homes tonight, food in the cabinet. Mm-hmm. Listen, there's women and children and men I watched today on television and said, we don't know what we're going to do. We have no home to go back to. We have no money. We have no vehicle we have no job we we have nothing we don't know what we're going we're hopeless one of them said oh, yes yeah. they are i right. could not imagine walking in their shoes mm-hmm. absolutely look at isaiah 55 and 11 so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth y'all read it with me let's just read it out loud for the devil to hear how about that Let's start it over and read it together. How about that? Let's Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return vo- void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Amen. Yes. It shall prosper. So when he speaks it out of his mouth, and he gave us the right. We're his children. We can speak his word out of our mouths, and it would perform what God meant for it to perform. If you've got a family member that's, that's drug addicted, all right, you speak that word of freedom over them, not our words, because our words are empty. Our words are, oh, I just want to help you. Oh, you need an intervention. Oh, I love you. Speak his word. Speak his word. Talking about the captives being set free. Speak his word over them. They have no choice but to respond. Because that's the living word of God. You're creating. You're creating freedom for them when you speak that word. And it might take a little bit of time. But you got somebody in your family. I've done this. you got somebody in your family that's depressed. This is not on, thank the Lord. So we're just audio tonight. You got somebody in your family that's depressed? Just take your Bible and go through your house. Walk through your house. It doesn't matter if you start with Psalms or it doesn't matter. Start with the Proverbs. Start with the Psalms. Start with the promises of God and go around your house speaking that word out. This is what I got for you, spirit of depression. This is what I've got for you. He that the Lord has set free is free indeed. Speaking that out into their space, into the, where they are, because they don't have the strength to do it for themselves. They don't have the, they're, they're, they're weary. You know, they, they don't have the strength to pray. But you get that word and you start calling it out over them. I speak healing. I think it's in Jeremiah, heal me and I shall be healed. 
Save me and I shall be saved, Lord. Speak that out over your children that are unsaved. Go into your kids' rooms. I love what Dexter said about going into his grown son's rooms who are away at college and away, you know, with careers right now. He went into their rooms and he's praying over them in their room. Let me tell you something. God is connected. He is, you got his attention. Go to the places where your family members that struggle are struggling. Go down on your knees in those places. Maybe it's a granddad, and he likes to hang out in the shop. When he's not there, go anoint that shop and pray over it and speak the word of faith over it. Pictures. Pray over pictures. You Pray over anything. Get a T-shirt. That's what that box that we have in the front of the church that looks like a little, little treasure chest. There's treasures in there, all right. There's T-shirts, there's combs, there's toothbrushes from people that are unsaved that we pray over. We've anointed, anointed them with oil, praying over them, praying the word of faith over them. But there is nothing in this world more powerful than God's word. So when you don't know what to say, just get the word out and start speaking it out loud. You know, Pastor and I, we have... On our phones, we have these Bible apps, and a lot of times during the day, if we're at home, I put it on the where it reads to me, and I just put it out where it's just reading out into my house. It's just reading God's Word out into my house. That's God's Word filling my space. Let me tell you something. The devil can't stay there. The devil can't stay where God's Word is. It slices. What is he? The prince and the power of the? The air. Why do you think it's so important that we put God's word out into the air? We just sliced Satan's abode right down the middle when we speak his powerful word out. It takes authority and rule over the prince and the power of the air when we speak God's word out. And see, the devil don't want you to do that. He wants you to think, then people's going to think you're crazy. Let me tell you something. I've gone out in my yard and taken my Bible out and walked around my property speaking the word of God. Anything that comes against me in any way, shape, or form, we've done it around this church. We've done it around this whole block. Speaking God's word out. It's powerful, and it works. It does. It works. That person that I was telling you in the family that had that that depression, it's gone because we have put word out into the space of, into the air. Oh my goodness, I I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you how excited this makes me when, when I talk about the word. But look at number eight, talk is cheap, right? (laughs) How many of you know that? Our talk, that's our talk, not God's talk, but that's our talk is cheap. We have to be doers. A is doers. We, doers, It's a word. We have to be doers of his word and not hearers only. Look at James 1 and 22. That's exactly what James 1 and 22 says. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So if you're just sitting on the pew on Sunday and you never interact and you never pray and you never pick up the word, and you just come on Sunday, and then you go home, and you're never changed, what does this word, what did James 1 and 22 say you were doing to yourself? You're deceiving yourself into thinking that I'm there. I'm in. Just, you know, just because, uh, what's the old saying? Just because you, uh, uh, oh, while you're thinking, let me just say this. Uh, there's one thing in the scripture that condemns us quicker than any sin or immorality, and that's the sin of doing nothing. He yeah. said he walked by a green tree, yeah. and it had no fruit on it. <clears throat> and he told the disciples to cut it down and throw it in the fire. And cursed it, yeah. And I think you can put two and two together what that meant that your tree should not be a green tree, but it should have fruit growing on it. Now, he used a tree as a metaphor, example, or whatever, but 
There ought to be fruit in our lives where we have sown into the lives of others yes. and shown them the truth yes. of why you're baptized and why yes. you need the Spirit and these things. Absolutely. This isn't stuff I'm making up. It isn't doctrine that Absolutely. I'm making up. I'm just reading the Scripture, you know. That's right. And, w and that's what's going to judge us at the judgment. Right. And we'll determine whether we go into the lake of fire or not. And I ain't playing when it comes to that. Absolutely. Hey, I ain't going to the hot place. <laughs> I'm going to live right, and I'm going to tell you how to live right, and whatever you do with it, as the old man used to say, that's your red wagon. Absolutely. You know, he's talking about that green tree. It was still green. Oh, it looked live. It looked lively. It looked beautiful. It was all green, just no fruit. So that's what, I don't want to be that. Look at number two, Hebrews 11 and 7. Who wants to read that for us? Hebrews, Hebrews 11 and 7. It says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, even though he couldn't see it, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, mm -hmm. by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith, Right. He's got here a side note. Noah didn't go on a fast asking God to stop the rain. He simply got to work. Yes. Are you facing an impending storm? Is there something or someone coming against you? By faith, get to work doing what God said to do, and he will keep you. Amen. How many of you, like me, caught yourself when coronavirus first started coming out, rebuking the virus? Yeah. Binding the virus. Lord Jesus, just, just annihilate that virus. And God was using, he didn't create it, but he used it. Look at how many people have come to him during that time period that didn't, didn't come to him any, before that. I mean, they just, it wasn't even a thought on their minds. He wasn't even a thought on their minds until they started seeing people die around them. And then they started saying, you know what? I think I need to get right with God. And in Noah's day, it had never rained before. Absolutely, it had never so rained. So they thought he was off his rocker. Yep. Man, look at this cat. And I'll guarantee you, it doesn't <laughs> say this in the scriptures, Yep. but I'll guarantee you there were other people building boats likewise. Mm -hmm. And were saying, come on over here and get on my boat. Yeah. You ain't got to do all that to ride on this boat. <laughs> you can ride over here for free. Uh-huh. Yep. You know, it, that's right. That's the way I, Brother I Mike, did you have something? Okay. Okay. All right. We won't forget. Look at James 2, 20 through 23, and this is the amplified version. So they're going to explain a lot of those words. Brother Freeze, you want to read that? Uh, yes, ma'am. James 2, verse 20 through 23. Are you willing to be shown proof, you foolish, unproductive, spiritual deficient? <laughs> Fellow that faith apart from good works is inactive and ineffective and worthless. Was not our forefather Abraham shown to be justified, made acceptable to God by his works, when he brought to the altar as an offering his own son Isaac? You see that his faith was cooperating with his work, his works and his faith was completed and reached its supreme expression when he implemented it by good works. Verse 23. And so the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed in, adhered to, trusted in, and relied on God. And this was accounted to him as righteousness, as conformity to God's will in thought and deed. And he was called God's friend. Wow. Wow. Because he believed God's word. And he didn't just believe it. He actually started on the way to sacrifice his, own, his only son to God. You know, he actually got up and did what God told him to do. How many of us would have done that? It would have been really hard for me. I'm just being transparent. You know, given my only child. But, you know, I may have done like Abraham did or... I may have just said, God, you're going to have to use somebody else, you know. But Abraham, in the back of his mind, knew that God didn't approve of human sacrifice. 
So he thought, okay, God's trying to teach me something. Let me go see what it is. That was a hard lesson. You know, I, I listened to a sermon one time that, that was talking about worshiping with a knife. He called it worship. He said, me and the lad are going to go and worship, knowing what God had asked him to do. So are, are we willing to go worship with a knife? Are we willing to, to maybe not do something that God doesn't want us to do or give, give up something for God that he's asked for? You know, I don't know. That's up to you. We can't be God to you. You know, we're not going to tell you what you can and can't do, but we will tell you what works in the Word. So to activate and exercise our faith, we must. Look at number one, because I, I know we're running out of time. We've got to believe in who God is and his ability to answer. He can do anything. We've watched with our own eyes as God raised a woman from our chairs who yep. was dead. She was dead. She was gone. She had no heartbeat. She had no pulse. She had no breath in her body. And she was ashen gray. It was, was it? Wow. Whew. Look at that. God can do anything. She was without a pulse. They did three rounds. We had a trauma nurse in our church and another nurse in our church, and they took turns. They did three rounds of CPR on her, and I mean when they were doing that CPR, Sister Melissa, just like you taught us, when you hear it crack, you know you're doing it right. That's exactly what they were doing. They knew what they were doing, and they were giving her, they finally gave her mouth-to-mouth, and it still didn't work. She just looked up at me. We were in the middle of service. God was moving. Music was going. And a lot of people were so caught up in the, in the worship. You know, God, people just pouring tears. And God was moving so sweetly in our service. They didn't even know what was going on. They didn't even know. My Everybody was standing worshiping. It was very, it was awesome. She got up and walked to the ambulance. She did. After about not no pulse and no breathing for over 12 minutes. Yeah, we get to the hospital, and the doctor thinks we're crazy. He, he's yeah. like, what, what, are y'all, what are y'all doing here with her? I said, she just died. What mm -hmm. do you mean she just died? I said, well, she died, and we prayed for her. She got back up. Yeah. She was out. She was gray. And Danny said, just like he said, we'd call the ambulance as soon as we figured out something was going on. And the ambulance got lost yeah. in Manning. <laughs> wow. Help me. How does that happen? I, I don't know. I want to mention something real quick. The Bible doesn't reference it as far as Noah goes. But when Noah built the ark, the ark was uh, the water that he was using was the sy symbolic of baptism. Mm -hmm. The water was going to separate Noah and his family from the old sinful world. Yep. In 1 Peter 3 and 21, it does make reference that they were all baptized in the Red Sea mm -hmm. when they crossed over, leaving Egypt behind. Mm -hmm. So everything God did in the Old Testament is a reason. And then in the new, we do the same thing. When we leave the old man behind, we baptize him and bury him for good, and we never get him back. Amen. Start a brand new life, brand By new faith. creature in Christ. By faith. By faith. Still talking about faith. So look at number two. Speak his promise out loud over your situation. Number two is situation. And God, remember who is that word, will respond. Because you are, you are actually calling him down, God himself, into the room. You're saying, Lord, I need you to move. When you speak his word over a sick person, like we did over that, that woman, we were praying over her, speaking the word over her, and um, the faith was high in the room, and God came down. Exactly, but look at God. <laughs> you mentioned it that night when me and Allison were sitting there. And it, absolutely, really creeped us out. We didn't stay there long. <laughs> Scoot on over. I'll be honest with you, I didn't think she was coming back. Yeah. She was gray. She was gray. 
I, I do have one one question, or yes. just just an opinion thing on Abraham, right? Mm -hmm. How many Abrahams? You know, it talks about Abraham in here. How many Abrahams got might have God spoken to before him oh that, my God. That, that didn't that didn't my go God. to do that, that right? And, and that, that weren't, wasn't obedient. And you know, Abraham was finally the guy that stepped up to say, "I'm gonna my works are gonna show it." And now look what he got blessed with. Whew. That's that's powerful. Yes, Wonder how many Noahs there were, you know, that could have been. Amen. Look at number three. That's powerful. We take action to put into operation the commands in God's word by faith. We do what he says. We do what he says. That's number three. And we don't worry about our reputation. You know, what are people going to think about if, if this woman doesn't raise up from the dead? What are they going to think about us then? Are they going to think we're weak? We weren't worried about that at that moment. We were. Exactly. That is on God. We it's need to speak out loud concerning the Ukraine. I've been praying that Putin's army will be confounded with confusion and that they fall on their own sword. It's happening. It really is. It's happening. So look at number four. Other ways to increase our faith by hearing the word preached or taught and studying and meditating over it. Crystal taught last week and Freeze talked last week. It was phenomenal what they talked about, connecting the heart with the mind in faith, connecting the heart with the mind. You got to hear that word preached or taught and study and meditate over it. Look at Romans 10 and 17. Who wants to read that? says, so then faith comes by hearing. Everybody say hearing. Hearing. And hearing by the word of God. So when you come to church and you hear the word of God, it builds our faith. Yes, it does. Amen. Look at number five. By another way you can build your faith is you can read books. You can read blog posts about pioneers of faith. Pioneers of faith. If God did it for them. He will do it for me. You have to claim that. If God healed, you know, and I'm standing here before you. I, was, I had cancer in 1993, and it was in the third stage. And God healed me before I had the first chemo treatment, before I had the first surgery. He healed my body, and I remember I felt him healing me. Amen. It happened. I remember and I, I, rem I told the doctor because he got angry because I told him I was going to church and that night and I was going to have the, the church, uh, the pastor and ministry anoint me with oil and pray over me that God would heal me. And he got angry and cursed. He said, Mrs. Gleason, God doesn't heal people. Doctors heal people. And something rose up inside yeah. of me, Sister Melissa. And I said, well, guess what? You're about to see one that God heals because I'm going to go to church tonight and they are going to lay hands on me and God is going to heal me. And as I'm saying this, I'm thinking, what am I saying? What if he doesn't? Yeah. But it, I was so, it just that righteous, that righteous indignation got a hold of me so bad. I said, you know what? God's going to heal me. And I went to the pastor and I said, I need you to pray for me tonight because I want to show that doctor what God can do. His word does not. And it will accomplish the thing that he sent it out to do, right? That's right. Let me tell Amen. you this real quick. This is, this, is a, this is a true story by Brother Orlin Ray Foss out in Texas. When he was about nine years old, his mother sent them to the store with 10 cents they had nothing to eat. He said, all we had was one dime. And, of course, back in them days, you could get some flour and a few little things with a dime. And he said, we got all the way down. The, the, the little store there was next to a railroad crossing. And the train had stopped across the street where we couldn't cross. So we stood there a little bit. He said, we walked down the tracks about a half a mile to where the caboose was at. My little brother used to call it the gong gone because that was the last one that went by. But anyway, he said, we crossed the tracks, and laying on the track 
was a brand new silver dollar. Now, this is a true story now. This isn't just something made up. And he said, we took that silver dollar to the store and bought all we needed and come back with change. And my mother was astonished at how, because when she sent them boys out with that 10 cents, she got out and prayed that, God, that you would multiply this, Lord. You know our needs. We don't have enough food in the house. And the 10 cents is not going to buy enough to sustain these growing boys and give them the vitamins and the things they need. Because back then, man, you could get sick and die over just nothing. You know what I'm saying? A sore throat could take you out. Pneumonia could come. There wasn't no antibiotics yet, you know. And, right. But he told the story of that. That was one of many he told. But that time he told of the silver dollar laying on the tracks. He said the train had to have ran over it. But somebody put it there after the train come to a stop. Amen. Won't he do it? He will do it. He'll supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Every time. Every time. Another good way to build your faith is by recording in a prayer journal, y'all. Here I go again, talking about that prayer journal. Miss Felicia's going to wear us out with that prayer journal. But that's the way it works. When you, You'll forget if you don't write it down. You know, and it's the little things sometimes that, that are powerful. You know, they were talking about that at the conference, how God answered I don't have enough time to tell you about it, but maybe the next person who's teaching can talk about it. But it was powerful how God answered multiple people's prayer requests over one little thing that the speaker was doing and didn't even know she was doing. It was amazing. But prayer, you know, the prayer journals are, are very, they're very good tools to build your faith. Number seven, by overcoming, I'm sorry, number six, that last word was answered going back from time to time and remind yourself about how God answered. That's number six. But number seven, by overcoming testimonies that we share. You know, the church has gotten away from testimony sharing. We need to get back to that because we are overcomers by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, right? So there is power in our spoken testimony. How is anybody going to know what God has done for you if you don't tell it? Get on Facebook and talk about it. Take a video. I love Sister Mina getting on, on Facebook. She's done it one time that I know of. I don't know if she's done it since. And she just read the word and talked about the goodness of God. Do that. You don't know who that's going to affect because once it goes on the Internet, it's there forever and ever, right? So it might help somebody five years from now. You never know. All right, so we, we've got to share it, share it, share it. Share that spoken testimony. Number eight, by just enduring. It's, you know, it'll help your faith to just stick in there and don't give up. Keep coming to church. Keep doing the right thing. Keep taking your family down to prayer at night. Keep reading the word out in, in front of your kids at night. That works. That's just enduring. Hebrews 11 and 13 talks about all those that died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. They didn't even have the Holy Ghost. These people that they're talking about in Hebrews chapter 11 didn't have the Holy Ghost, and we've got it. All they could see was just they could see it afar off, that, that promise was coming. And they believed God for it. So they died in faith. Look at nine. Another way that you can build your faith is by stepping out of your current situation with courage in what God can do through you. Oh, I believe God will do it for Brother Freeze. I believe God will do it for Wiley. You know, I believe he'll do it for Brother Mike, Brother Warren. But I don't know if he'll do it for me. You're his child. He'll do it for you. It's the same promise. So we've got to step out. Hebrews 11 and 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Amen? By faith, they stopped the mouths of lions. So we're here on the flip side of this world pandemic. Thank God. 
But now we're in the middle of inflation and possible recession and possible wars and rumors of wars. Just today there was an earthquake in Japan. I was working 7.3. That's bad. It, it is a doozy. And the Lord told us, you're going to hear of these things, but take heart, you know. And so we've got to start intentionally putting our faith, growing our faith, stepping out on faith. And when God tells us to do something, do it. You know, even if it's just giving, if it's your, if you have struggled with tithing, you know, I promise you, if you step out and you do it, God will move on your behalf. He'll show you how he can work things. And his math makes no sense to me, Crystal. I am, I'm not good at math anyway. I'm okay. But his math just blows my mind. I don't know how it works, Brother Mike. It, every single time. He multiplies every time. And so I'm going to start putting God to the test. Anybody ready to put him to the test this week? Anybody going to step out and say, God, I want you to increase my faith. I'm going to stop begging you for, t I'm going to not beg you to stop the fiery trials. How many of you have, have been uh, uh, guilty of praying, God, just stop this. Just take it away. Just get me out of this. Instead, we need to say, God, what are you trying to teach me? Let me learn whatever it is quickly. <laughs> Let me get the lesson. I, want, I don't want to have to keep repeating ninth grade, you know? I don't want to have to keep repeating geometry. I hated geometry. I didn't want to have to repeat it, and I didn't have to, thank the Lord. But we've got to stop saying, God, get me out of this, and start saying, God, show me who I can help in the middle of this. Amen. Show me how I can be a blessing to you in the middle of this. Amen. So I'm, I'm just going to tell the devil, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to march right through this fire. And when I come out, I ain't even going, you're not even going to be able to smell the smoke on my clothes, Satan. Because God has got me. You bring on your heat. You bring on your flames. You bring on your trials. You bring on your fiery darts. I'm standing on the word, and I have a bubble of God's word around me. In 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 10, Verse 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. In other words, it happens to everybody. Yes. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way right. to escape, mm -hmm. that you may be able to bear it. Amen. So he takes us through these things to teach us lessons. Yes, he does. Teach us, you know, he, he taught me a long time ago to quit worrying about how many people's on the pew. You just worry about me. Because the more people you had, the more, uh, I guess a word would be more power the church had. Insecurity. Insecurity. But it, it's not that way at all. He, he does everything, and he owns everything. Yes. And uh, this last thing I'm going to say, y'all enjoy this. I think it's time to go home. Anyway, but uh, me and Celie first got in church, and she was a little more gun ho than I was. And uh, it come offering time, and she scratched off a $80 check and put in the offering plate. Well, it was the last 80 bucks we had. Well, I like to have a fit <laughs> because, you know, I didn't mind coming to church, but we wasn't getting into this thing monetarily yep. now, okay? You and know, I heard about it all and I, I, the way I home. did. I got angry. I got upset. I said, you better not ever do that again. <laughs> Uh, and I'm, I'm sitting here looking you. out the window going home saying, Jesus, and, uh, get him, get him, so, Jesus, get so him, I was, Jesus. I was so frustrated because we were busted. We didn't even have the money to go get something to eat. We had to go straight home, you know, and I, of course, I let her know about that too, you know. We ain't even got the money to go out and eat with nobody. We got to go home. So I, when I get frustrated, a lot of times I'll start cleaning up or something. Well, I decided to kitchen sink was the best place to start you know up under there it's always got stuff shoved under there so i started cleaning that thing out and of course i'm griping the whole time i'm cleaning it out because junk stuck under there you know and, one, and nobody knows how it got there mind you, know you what I'm this saying? was his house and we had and I just noticed met way, and got married way back up in the 
cabinet was a was a flower canister when it was aluminum ones it didn't have no lid but i went and put my hand on it and it was heavy so i slid that bad boy over there and looked at it well that thing was slam full of change now how it got under the kitchen sink is beyond me i'd never seen it well we lived in a 12 wide trailer house in them days and you had to go all the way to one end just to turn around and come back the other way <laughs> So I went down to the end of it where our bed was at. Of course, the bed took up the whole room, okay? So the, the only flat place we had to do anything was on the bed. So I dumped that thing out on the bed and counted it, and it was $80 in change. When we counted $79.99, But I had 80, to, I, I that day him. I had my hat in my hand, and I told her me. I was sorry. And God taught me a valuable lesson, you know, that I can provide. And he gave me all my money back. He said he didn't want my money. I told him, I said, I said, look at that. God didn't need your stupid $80. He did. That's the impression I got. So from then on out, when we went to church, I always brought my offering, and I figured in the tenth that I owed him to start with. I figured, you know, I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for him anyway, you know. So, And I'll be honest with you, ever since that day, in 1990, I've always paid my tithes, and usually, this just me now, I match my tithing with an offering yep. with the same amount, and I've just always practiced that, and uh, it's always paid off. The Lord's been good to us. I, You don't miss it. It all works out. You're blessed. The church is blessed. we got money to work with around here, and so that was a, a good lesson he taught me. Amen. She won't never let me forget Negative. <laughs> Because he was nasty going down that road that day. I thought, yep, God didn't need your stinking 80 bucks. Anybody have anything else before we go? Brother Mike, you got something? It'll build somebody's faith. Remember, we're overcomers by the word of our testimony. Okay, you guys forced me into this. It's several years ago, we'll say 10 years ago, uh, when me and my wife were together, I took a job that was about uh, 95 miles away from home. And in California, there's a lot of traffic, so the hustle and bustle, the traffic every day didn't make any sense. So uh, a couple times I would stay down there. Well, um, this one night in particular, we went to this restaurant, it's called home, Hometown Buffet, and uh, it's a buffet buffet place and a lot of people in there and we went and got our food and uh, I turned and noticed this one tall man really big man and I, I, I'm not small myself but this man is a big man and uh, he was kind of uptight I could tell he was uptight and um, when we're sitting down and I'm talking to my wife I go like you know what you know God's provoking me to go over and pray for that man and this is early in, in my walk mm -hmm. and I mean it was just so big and strong and real and I just you know I said oh, and she's like encouraging me oh go ahead go ahead I said no, no we'll just sit here and we'll pray <laughs> and, and no and, and I, I, I was definitely you know scared we're tracking. okay I'm just we're being tracking. real scared so we prayed at the table and da 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 and you know I felt convicted in my spirit okay Fast forward a month later or so, my wife comes down and spends the night with me again because I'm still working down there. We went to the same restaurant. Here's that same man again. Uh -huh. Here's that same prompting wow. to go up and pray for this man. Whew. Place is a madhouse. People run around all over the place, and I'm sitting there almost sweating, just going like, oh my, <laughs> and scared. Yeah. I'm going like stepping out in faith. Can be a rough thing, especially this yes. guy's six foot five, three hundred pounds, uh -huh. and I'm going like, once again, I denied the prompting, and did not do it, and I mean, and my spirit suffered mm. for months. Yes. Okay. Fast forward a, a, a few months later, um, I was taking um, my daughter to Las Vegas, yeah. and. Uh, went with a couple, uh, our niece and nephew and uh, we all piled in the car. We left in the morning. We went to a hometown buffet in our neck of the woods and I went in 
and there's this uh, Mexican family there, and um, and this Mexican guy like in a in a Jerry chair, not a wheelchair, one of those kind that controls and everything like this, in really bad shape, and surrounded by about 12 family members, and um, we got our food, and I sat down, and I go like, "Hun, I go." God's telling me to go pray for that man. And even though I could tell they don't even speak English. Mm -hmm. And once again, I'm letting it slide by. And every time I'd get up, here he is right in my, right in my presence. And I'm going like, oh, and the Lord just kept putting him in my presence. Well, I, we sat there and ate and watched that whole family leave right out the door before us. And I, and I just felt so terrible, but I let it happen. And then all of a sudden, we get up to leave and walking out the door, and I noticed that the whole group of them was standing right outside the exit. I, I can't make this stuff up. I'm not. We walked. I walked by them, walked to the car. Everyone gets in the car, and I said, honey, I got to go back there and pray. And I walked back, and this is when I engaged in some faith. Mm -hmm. I walked back there, and I just said, you know what? I, I need to pray for you right now. I don't know why that God has a word for you. And right then, mm. the Spirit of God just came down. Mm. And we all just started crying. I don't know the situation. I don't know the circumstance. But Spirit of God was right there. And it was so powerful. And I'm, I'm talking, we're blocking the exit, blocking the entrance. Mm. And we're just crying out to God. Then my wife comes over and grabs a hold. And it just lasts a brief minute. And I said... Okay. And I mean, we're all tears like this. And I said, okay, thank you. I walked back to the car. My, my daughter's going, Daddy, what's wrong? And I'm just driving away just going, nothing, honey. Nothing, honey. But uh, mm -hmm. I finally stepped out in faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that right there at one time in my walk was a tough thing to do. So if anyone here is struggling with mm -hmm. stepping out in faith. Do it. Please do it because I no longer have to deal with that gut, gut aching conviction that I had. Yes, absolutely. Amen. Okay. Amen. That's awesome. I believe that. I believe that. Why don't we stand together? And why don't we pray? You know, you can, you can leave out of here tonight and nothing change. You can leave out of here and say, God, I'm going to start building my faith. And God starts opening up a portal to the miraculous for you. The extraordinary, the, the, the crazy faith, the crazy stuff, the crazy answers. I believe he can do it. Yes, he can do the extraordinary. So why don't we pray together and ask God and, and close this out and say, Lord, burn this into my memory. Burn this into my heart. I want to start speaking your word out over people. I want to start obeying. I want to start being a doer of the word like Mike just talked about. I want to start doing what you said. Lay hands on the sick and they shall recover is what he said that believers could do. So why don't we lift our voices, close our eyes, lift our hands, and ask the Lord to help us and help our faith, increase our faith. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you tonight, God, for all the wonderful testimonies that we've heard here tonight. God, we thank you, Lord, for your word that you gave us, God. We lift our hands to you, Jesus. We lift our hearts to you, God. Lord, we lift our circumstance to you, Jesus. We know, God, that you can do all all things. So we pray, God, that this word would be burned into our memory. Burn your word on my heart, God, that I might not sin against you. But Lord, I could go further than that. Lord, I want to be a doer of your word. I want to lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. God, I want to, I want to pray and I want to believe your word and speak your word in faith. And you move, God. I know you will, Jesus. I thank you tonight, God. Lord, you're going to you're going to birth new things in every single one of us tonight, God. I thank you. I give you the glory. I give you all the praise and all the honor. Lord, keep us until we come again on Sunday, until we can lift up your name and praise again. Lord, help us to make a difference in the lives of people today. Help us, God, to make a difference in the lives of the people around us this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you so much.